Hi, my name is Dr. Robert Kaufman, and it's time for us to go beyond the terminus. Today, we're going to discuss a case of a 31-year-old female dental hygienist who was referred to me for consult and examination regarding a radiolucency associated with a mandibular second molar that the referring dentist had found during routine examination. The tooth had been endodontically treated about 10 years previously, and the patient arrived completely asymptomatic. The referring dentist was concerned that there was a radiolucent finding associated with the distal root apex. Clinical examination showed evidence of prior endodontic access with composite restoration. Patient biting, chewing, and periodontal findings were within the normal limits, and the patient had an extremely high dental IQ because obviously she was a hygienist. Conventional periapical imaging showed a radiolucent finding associated with the distal root. CBCT imaging confirmed the finding associated with the distal root, however, Further examination of the root in the CBCT image re revealed the presence of a lingual root, a fused radix mandibularis. The radix seemed to split off very far down the, down the, the distal canal, almost at the end. Examination of the axial slices showed virtually no canal space visible in the CBCT. Closer examination of the buccal cortical plate revealed it to be extremely thick and the apices of the, this particular tooth appeared to be very close to the lingual cortical plate, very far lingually, almost 15 millimeters from the buccal cortical plate. I explained to the patient that there was a persistent periapical radiolucent finding associated with the distal root, and then it was likely that the radix was the cause of the radiolucency. Unfortunately, we did not have any historical films available to us at the time of initial endodontic treatment. These would have been helpful to see whether this radiolucency had been present in the original pretreatment radiographs or not. This also would have been helpful us to determine whether the finding had remained the same size or increased in size over time. That would influence our decision as to how to treat the case. Should the area be the same, there would be less motivation to try to deal with the problem. Treatment options were explained to the patient. They included attempted conventional non-surgical retreatment of the distal root. I wasn't confident that we could easily find our way down the, this radix because of the severe calcification in the CBCT and the fact that it had branched off approximately 15 millimeters below the level of the occlusal surface, making visibility extremely difficult. We may have to sacrifice a lot of dentin to find it and run the risk of perforation. The patient and I agreed that the surgical option was not viable because of the thickness of the buccal cortical plate and position of the apices. Even if we managed to make surgical axis and merely attempted to remove the radic by resecting the distal root, we would have to lose a lot of this distal root to do that. After discussing the case with the patient, we agreed to leave the tooth as is and deal with it only if it became symptomatic. Should the tooth become symptomatic, we may consider extraction extraoral resection of the roots, and then re-implantation. But that's a lot of effort for a second molar, and few patients are willing to undergo replantation of a second molar when they have an intact dentition and have a reliable first molar that's minimally restored. Just because a tooth has a radiolucent finding doesn't necessarily mean that we must treat it. Does the radiolucency matter more to you, the clinician, than it does to the patient? The key with cases like this is to have a good history and preferably have some good historical images to be able to put the current radiographic condition in context with the overall case. In this case, although healing is incomplete, I believe that no treatment was the best option for this patient. Here's the case that we're discussing of this lower second molar. We can see here the endodontic, previous endodontic treatment, and we also have the radiolucency associated with the root. Yeah, if we look at the tooth a little bit more closely, we can see that this canal seems to be fairly well filled, pretty close to the radiographic terminus, yet we have a periapical radiolucency here. So what we also see is a lingual, a second root. If we examine the slices as we come down and we examine this panel right here, the axial version, what you'll see is the distal canal at this point in the tooth looks pretty centered in the center of the root. There's our mesial canals. So this looks pretty good. But if we go a little bit further, you will watch the lingual canal bud off. The lingual root will actually come off right about here. And we'll start to see 
the invagination right in this area and in this area coincident with the area of radiolucency. And there it is. There's the separate root at this level. Very, very close to the end of the tooth. So it's going to be extremely difficult for us to be able to get in here and go through this part of the tooth. Not only that, but if you look really carefully, we can also see there's very little in the way of a canal here. Can really can't see any sort of distinctive canal. So this would be an extremely difficult case to retreat conventionally. Unfortunately, if we look at the buccal cortical bone, it's really, really thick. And if we measure the distance, how far do we actually have to go to get to this root? We're looking at probably 13 or 14 millimeters in to the mandible to be able to actually reach this root. And even if we did and we decided we're not going to treat it, we're just going to resect it, we'd have to resect it probably up at this level, which would certainly compromise the length of the distal root probably to about this level. So all in all, when we look at this radiolucency in a patient that is completely asymptomatic, there's a lot of uh, motivation to do nothing, especially in the case where the patient has been asymptomatic since the case has been completed. It's nice to have some films to compare from the initial endodontic treatment, but in this case, we were not able to have that. So in uh, the case of this young patient, she decided that she wanted no treatment, and we will leave it and bring her back annually to see if the area enlarges or if she has symptoms. Remember, when we do the right thing, both of us get better, patients and clinicians. Thank you for turning into this edition of Beyond the Terminus. Remember, subscription is free, and this channel is not sponsored by any commercial company. It's driven by word of mouth and your referrals and recommendations. If you've enjoyed the content, please like and tell your colleagues. I look forward to seeing you again on our next trip when we go beyond the terminus. See you then.